In this episode, we speak with Michel Tricot, co-founder and CEO of Airbyte, the new open source data integration platform that syncs data from applications, APIs, and databases to data warehouses, lakes, and other destinations. Airbyte is backed by Excel, Benchmark, and Altimeter Capital, among other investors. The company has raised over $100 million since its founding in 2020. Prior to founding Airbyte, Michelle was a founding member and director of engineering at Ride OS, and before that was the director of engineering for LiveRamp. I'm your host, RJ Lumba. We hope you enjoy the show. Michelle, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's a delight to be with you. What I'd like to do is kick off a little bit of your background because you've started this company and you've done so, I'd say fairly recently, but you've raised a lot of capital. And so we're interested to hear about your background, what got you to the point of founding the company, and then we'll dive into the company. Thank you for, for having me. On my background, so for the, I've been in the data space for the past 15 years, so I've lived through all the Hadoop and Spark and now data warehouse type of infrastructure, all this industry. And I studied as an engineer. I was working on financial data back in Paris. And in 2011, that's when I moved in the US and I joined at the time a small startup called LiveRamp, which was middleware in all the MarTech and AdTech ecosystem. And basically at that point, we're just integrating with all the ecosystem for marketing, online advertising and moving our customers' data into all these platforms. And what we are doing is integrating with thousands of different players in this ecosystem, moving hundreds and hundreds of terabytes of data every single day. And I was there from like LiveRamp being a very scrappy startup up to acquisition and IPO. And I had the, the opportunity to lead a large part of the engineering and product team over there that was building, maintaining, and scaling all these data connectors. So I would say I've always, my whole career, I've been in the data space. And what I've learned from my experience at Ivan is how the industry was shifting toward more of the data warehouses. And what does it mean for the rest of the companies now? Now that the warehouses are easy to use, cheap, elastic, and where you can have more and more people interacting with it. What will be the, the new challenges that people will be facing with that? And that's how we, John and I decided to start Airbyte. Okay, got it. For those in our audience that might not be as familiar with how kind of the use of data or how data has become leveraged, more and more leveraged over the years, your expertise in warehousing then converted into integration. And at that time, were you already seeing companies that were kind of taking the lead in terms of integration? The first thing is the need for data integration was very, very present in data company. Like, Company that are dealing with a lot of data. The thing is, not everybody, not every company uses data or used to use data. But now with data warehouses, it has become so easy to have access to this compute power to get insight on your data that every single company, as they migrate toward cloud, they're also migrating to using and to include data warehouses as part of their toolbox for making better decisions. The thing is, because warehouses have become so easy to use, these companies are also looking at what kind of talent do they need to be good with data. And sometimes they need data engineers, sometimes they need analytics engineers, sometimes they just need analysts. But you see that the profile of people that are now interacting with warehouses is just being removed a little bit more from like the nitty-gritty details of the Hadoop of the back in the days where you need to have like hardcore software engineers and data engineers like dealing with the data. It's just approachable by more people. And the thing is the more people are playing with data, the more they want data, the more they realize that they are blocked. They don't have access to that data. They have all these different silos. They have data on Stripe, they have data on Salesforce, NetSuite, databases. And what they are looking to do is like, okay, either I ask an engineer to build this type of connectors or I find a solution to do it for me and something that can really enable me to be good with data. And it's just a natural thing is you buy a warehouse, the first one you have is how do you get data in? That's where Airbyte plays. And that was playing very well also on my co-founder and my expertise in the past. Now, there are already some companies that are doing it, but they are not open source, meaning that they will always have the problem of plateauing in the number of connectors that they have. I mean, you have like companies like Fireflown or Stitch, they will always have to plateau because it's hard to build data connectors 
but it's very, very hard to maintain them. And for that, you need to have a community of users and developers to help you on this maintenance. Well, what's like kind of the best example of a company really leveraging Airbyte? And I'll relate this to the fact that you closed the big round late last year and you brought in some excellent investors and in Altimeter and Co2 and Excel and others. So there must have been something like very compelling for them to say, all right, this is the one we're backing. Yeah, I would say the approach we have is extremely strong in a sense that when a company buys a warehouse, they buy the warehouse. Next step is they're going to ask data engineers, can you build data connectors? I need to provide some analytics or I need to provide some information to my finance team across how the product is behaving, across how the billing is behaving, across all these different segments of places where you have data. The default with data integration is never to buy. The default is always to build. And that's where open source is key because open source replaces the build. And you want to make sure that when practitioners and when data engineers are kind of tasked to build these data connectors, they don't want to do it. They will be looking at what exists on open source. And the moment you're in with Airbyte, then you can solve this one use case that the practitioner was tasked to build. But now you can also expand because Airbyte comes with an ecosystem of data connectors that are built and maintained by our teams or the community. And suddenly, maybe you start with ingesting Stripe data. And then some another team is asking, you, oh, I need NetSuite data. And boom, you put NetSuite data. And you start growing and growing and growing internally with Airbyte. That's really the, the thing is, you want to catch the build. These are systems that generally grow organically in companies. You're from another country, you're from France, you come to the States, and you're able to become an entrepreneur and do all this in fairly short order. I think it's challenging enough if you're from the States to do what you've done. And so tell us a little bit about that journey and how you were able to navigate. I would say the first thing is I've always wanted to come to, a, to the Bay Area, to San Francisco in the US, just be part of this big startup ecosystem. It's always the same thing. You realize when you've been lucky in life. And I think at that point, finding LiveRamp as a company was my luck. And it really paved the way to what I am today in a sense that it was a company that was working on a problem I was passionate about, which is access to data and uh, what can you do with data. The second one is a company that was really pushing for extreme ownership and really grew a lot of very strong data leaders within this company. And I would say that was really a defining experience for me, besides Airbyte, obviously. Like Airbyte is probably even more defining. <laughs> but And the fact that also it was, I was fully emerged in all the, the startup ecosystem and new technologies from LiveRun. So I think that was more my learning phase at that point. Can you tell us a little bit about your investors? Are they more so investors that interact with you at a higher level? Do they get involved at all with some of the key issues facing the company operationally or strategically? How do you interact with your investors? What value have they provided? So that's a good question. One thing we've been very specific about with the investors that we're working with is, first, they need to understand what open source means. What does it mean to build an open source business? And I think at that point, when you look at Axel, when you look at Benchmark, they have a very strong track record on helping and working with open source companies that are creating a strong commercial product. So that was very important to us. And yes, two days ago, I was talking with our investor from Benchmark and from our investor from Axel. So what happens on that point is they're going to help us a lot on executing candidates that we really want to get. and like how they can help by like convincing them that Airbyte is the, the right place to be in for them. So they help a lot on all this company building aspect. For Kutu and uh, Altimeter, and they know what is our key priorities today. They know it's around hiring. They know it's around like commercialization of cloud. It's around like getting intros to specific customers. And at that point, yeah, we work with all of them. And depending on where they have their strengths. We're going to be working with one instead of the other. Or sometimes we're just going to bounce back to someone else. But I feel it's like a, a mix of yeah, company building and business and, and helping on the go-to-market side. What's been the hardest part so far of sitting at the helm of a fast-growing company? What are the biggest challenges you face today? I would say 
as a company is we are growing the team and you want to make sure that you're not just growing for the sake of growing while at the same time you realize that the market is ready for our product but we're still a very early company there are still things where we are not mature enough and having to battle between we have a market that has been using Airbyte now for a year that is looking to also use cloud. And at the same time, for that, you need to have a larger engineering team, a larger product team, a larger go-to-market team. But how do you make sure you don't just grow for the sake of growing just because you feel that pain and instead you continue to grow smartly, especially in today's market? We need to be a lot more prudent about not going crazy. But I would say that's the thing. Is What's hard is you see the market, you see it's ready, and what do you need to do? How do you need to prioritize your product to make sure that you can really tackle all these different problems from the market, although you're still a young company? And so how did you decide on the amount of capital you wanted to raise in the round? And have you been deploying that fairly systematically? I would say at that point, 2021 was really for us about proving the project market fit for Airbyte. And just to give you an idea of it, when we started raising the Series B. We had about 20, oh, maybe it was 15,000 at the time. Today, we're about 30,000 companies that have deployed Airbyte. We have about 1,800 that are that have been using Airbyte. And the moment when you realize that you have this type of numbers, you realize that what is going to be a blocking factor for you is going to be your ability to execute. And your ability to execute is something where you need capital for. And when we went for the Series B, that was really our mindset, which is we have the traction we want for open source. We have the traction we want for cloud. Today, yes, we still have some money in the bank from the seed and the series A, but we're going to need more. And at that point, it was just, okay, let's do it now because we know this need and we know that we need that money in the future. So let's do it now and start scaling the company. It was really based on the moment you have product market, it just becomes, can you get the right fuel to help you grow? One of the things that I like to ask entrepreneurs, because it's, it's a very tough road, is can you tell us about certain points in time where you really struggled and maybe you didn't think you'd be able to kind of push ahead and you know advance the company? Do you have any of those moments? Yes. <laughs> it's funny because it happens differently. We had two phases within the Airbyte story. We had the pre-end of July 2020 and the post-July 2020. We've really started to work on the Airbyte product in July 2020, and we released it end of the year, 2020. But before that, so we went through YC, started with an idea, still always in the data space, always around data integration, but more geared toward marketing. And you realize that you have all these, these things that you, I mean, you're not working in the data space for 15 years, Things should go simple. I mean, you have a good understanding of the market, of the industry. You start building a product, product destruction, and March 15, lockdown in the whole world. And the people you are selling the product to, budget is frozen or they've closed. And you've already started to start a small team. And I think at that point, it really hits you that you cannot just rely on the small signal that you see. and if you see like this type of very big red flag in the sense that your product cannot survive a global pandemic, means that maybe it's not the right product that you should be building. I mean, I know it's very extreme as a situation, but we were not planning for it to happen, obviously. As an entrepreneur, when you face that kind of situation, for the first time, I don't think anyone has faced like a global pandemic in the past. There is no recipe on how to do it. And then it's just, okay, let's break and let's take a step back. Let's think about what we need to do. But that was a very, very hard moment because especially that we had a small team at the time, like how do you make sure that the people continue to trust that with John and I will still be able to like build a great company, although we have to shut down this particular product? And how do you continue to keep people engaged as you're going through that pivot? So it sounds like it was just a temporary lull in purchasing. No, no, we, we really had to change the product completely. Oh, okay. I mean, before it was, it was really a product geared toward marketing teams. And marketing was very much on pause for the like almost six months when COVID started. At that point, we also refocused product to be more on the like talking to engineers, more as a, a devtool type of product. It was a pretty big pivot. Yeah. 
Well, we're coming up on time here. I'd like to end with a couple questions. Veers more towards the personal side. Could you tell us about someone you particularly admire and maybe you kind of draw on the person and their attributes when you're trying to make a decision or you're trying to figure out how to handle a certain situation? Is there a person that could be across any domain of expertise? Maybe not across any domain of expertise, but definitely over the past two years, we've created some very strong relationship or with a few people around the go-to-market side. Whenever we have like big decision to make or just even the tactical question on how they would approach it, like understand what is their framework, that's the person we're going to go to. Same thing on people leadership, creating a good culture at the company. We also have someone that we talk to, but I don't think you can find a generalist that knows everything about everything. So you need to figure out every single... And same thing for investors. Some are going to be much better at helping you hire like a VP of engineering and others are going to be better at helping you hire like a, a VP of sales. And you need to figure out who are these people. And uh, yeah, today we, we're surrounded with a few of these. And that's actually also people that we generally brought in into uh, as like angels into our bite. Is there someone like just a leader in general that you admire? It, yeah, I mean, definitely one person that I really admire just for the type of culture that they've been able to create. One example would be someone I work with at Tyrant. He was the former CTO of Tyrant, Jeremy Litz. Just an amazing person. And you see that when you have someone that forces you to go back to your fundamentals, instead of just looking at the noise that is being created, they force you to just go down and figure out, okay, what exactly are you trying to solve at that market? Because with all the activities of creating... A company, sometimes you get lost into a bit of details, but there is always a fundamental that you need to uh, figure out first. Last question. Can you tell us about a book or is there a book that you would recommend, one that has had particularly profound impact on you? I can even tell you when I read it. I read it in 2014. It was called High Output Management. That was is really the moment when I started to transition from IC to management. And there is always this struggle on feedback loop and how do you evaluate your work and how is your work actually changing as you're starting to manage people. And yeah, higher output management was just, it clicked the moment I read it and it absolutely changed the way I was thinking about management and building things. Whenever someone around me asks me like, any tips around management, I just buy them the book. <laughs> Excellent. I will check it out for sure. Well, Michelle, really appreciate the time again. I know our audience will find this very insightful. Thank you for having me. 